This session is on presentation on theoretical framework for prevention of financial frauds. This session is going to be chaired by Mr. Srinivas Kumar. May I have the pleasure to invite him on the podium? The panelists in this session are Mr. Amarjit Chopra, who is, who is not with us, so he is going to be replaced by Mr. Mehta, who is the Principal Commissioner of Income Tax, New Delhi. Mr. Mehta may kindly come up. Dr. Salim Ali, former Special Director, CBI. Mr. Sanjay Jain, CVO, Punjab and Sindh Bank. And Ms. Navita Shrikant, Forensic Advisor and former Lead Specialist, the World Bank. With the permission of the chair, I would like to request I would like to request Mr. Siddiqui to come up and occupy the chair. I would now, I would now request the chair to start the proceedings in this session. So good morning, uh, all of you, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, to participate in this uh, conference organized by the Anti-Corruption Academy. Uh, we are told that uh, because the program is uh, uh, kind of run late, we have about 30 minutes, and uh, we have five of us here on the panel, uh, I think which would give us each about uh, five, six minutes uh, and if time permitting, maybe we could have some uh, interaction with the, with the floor. So this would be more like, a, as I was mentioning to my panelists, uh, like an elevator speech. So you have whatever you have to say, say it quickly in five minutes. Uh, so uh, I would start uh, um, by making some uh, broad uh, points, which I had uh, thought I would um, uh, so this, uh, uh, when, where I come from is that I had, uh, while on deputation with the Center for Good Governance, Hyderabad, uh, had compiled uh, 29 good practices for managing the risk of fraud. This was uh, a project which was funded by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office of UK. Now why is this um, uh, compilation uh, thought necessary is because uh, you see that uh, fraud is happening all the time everywhere. I mean, like, you know, from the time I think I remember joining the civil services, I mean, you've seen frauds happening, you know, whether it is the benefit uh, payment frauds, muster roll frauds, pension payment frauds, payroll frauds, and then the larger ones like, you know, the Florida scam and then the urea scams, you know, you have the large and small, the frauds are happening all the time. But what is missing here is that there is absolutely be no attempt to systematically gather data uh, or you know even think of you know uh, why these frauds are taking place what is the methodology how do we counter them how do you how, how do we respond to them nor even in some cases the lessons that have been learned in some 
frauds have been kind of internalized, institutionalized in terms of you know changed uh, procedures or changed um, uh, you know processes. So therefore, uh, but whereas if you look at uh, globally, I mean you know I looked at the uh, practices all over the world, and you find that, for instance, the UK has an orange book uh, which deals with the risk of uh, you know risk management in government. Similarly, Australia has uh, uh, at the government level they have you know, manuals which deal with, you know, how to deal with the risk. But my own experience in the government has been that there has absolutely been no attempt to uh, manage the risk of fraud. There is uh, no such manual, there is no such guidance. Uh, so therefore, you know, what happens, in fact, there is also nobody who is even in charge. Like, for instance, in most of the countries, uh, uh, developed countries, you have a fraud risk policy. You have somebody who is in charge of, uh, uh, you know, assessing the risk and, you know, uh, taking action on that. Whereas in India what happens is that it is everybody's business and therefore it becomes nobody's business to deal with the fraud and until the fraud happens, you really don't know that uh, uh, it, 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 nobody deals with it. That's point number one. Then the point number two is that, you know, like we have, you know, like we use fraud and corruption almost interchangeably but they're different. Fraud is deception, concealment, and through that you gain some unfair advantage. Corruption is misuse of public office for personal gain. But then fraud and corruption, they have, if you take them as a concentric circles, they have a place where they meet. That's where you have a collusive fraud, you know, where somebody in a position in the company or in the bank or in the government helps or facilitates a fraud to take place. Why is this distinction important is that, you know, like you have, as far as corruption is concerned, there is a law, there is an anti-corruption bureau, there is a civil, there is a central vigilance commission, at the state level you have uh, similarly the sim, uh, institutional mechanisms and the laws. But as in case of fraud, there is no law. Like, you know, for instance in India, unlike again in the UK and US, UK has a fraud act of 19, 2006 and then you have uh, Major Fraud Act of 2000, uh, 1988 in the U.S. So they have a separate law which, uh, I mean, you know, defines fraud and uh, uh, deals with the fraud. Whereas in India, you have one is the Contract Act, which also talks of fraud. But then, a fraud committed under Contract Act is voidable. A contract is voided, but there is not a criminal offence. The person who is uh, cheated under the contract law can take a civic, a civil uh, compensation, but it's not a criminal offence. And IPC does deal with fraud, but it doesn't define fraud. It only says actions which are done fraudulently. And like, you know, it includes cheating, misappropriation, and, you know, impersonation, whole lot of other uh, things or sections they deal with it, but then the fraud by itself is not defined or is not dealt with separately. It's not as if there have been no uh, thought on this. There has been Santanam Committee, and there, there have, thereafter the RBI's Mitra Committee, they went into this and they propose that we should have a separate law or at least in IPC a separate chapter which will deal with the fraud exclusively. But it is not the case today. And that could be uh, possibly, I, I leave it to I mean, my esteemed panelists and also the uh, participants to debate and then consider whether that is something which we should have. Then the other thing is about the white collar crime. Now, what we talked about, you know, all these crimes, you know, which Mr. Uh, Corel also mentioned is, you know, you sit in your uh, garage or you sit in your kitchen and then commit a crime or, you know, using computers uh, and, you know, carry on this. It's not like, you know, you uh, haste, like, you know, you go with guns and uh, blazing and uh, rob something. These kind of crimes are taken less seriously by society for a simple reason because the victim is faceless, you know, like what happens is if there is a rape or a murder or there is a, a certain kind of a problem with the security, there is everybody is insecure about it. Uh, uh, cr crimes of that nature, you know, arouse passions in the public and there is a, a kind of a uh, outcry. But white collar crimes, you, they seem victimless because, you know, you find that, you know, okay, somebody has committed a, like for instance, who has heard of this NSEL scam? Who has heard of, you know, those kind of, you know, very sophisticated scams that take place through, you know, these shell companies and all that. So, they seem victimless, but they are not. These are, the society at large is a victim and therefore they need to be dealt with. Now then, uh, the other point which I want to make is that the fraud, if you look at it, you know, you need to understand that the fraud happens because of three reasons. One is, 
I think which has been uh, highlighted by the justice uh, uh, all as well, is that there is an attitude, there is a question of values. You say, okay, it is all right to commit a fraud. I mean, it's all right to gain an unfair advantage by deceiving somebody. That's the basic first reason. The second reason is the opportunity. Somebody leaves the door open. Somebody leaves an opportunity for somebody to commit uh, fraud. And the third is the incentive. The incentive is, again, comes from you are not having enough deterrence. Suppose if I, am, I as a company, or if there is a law, as I think has been mentioned, if a loophole has been left in the law for people to commit, that, that incentivizes. And the other incentive is, like, suppose if your investigation is very lax, conviction is very poor, so you know that even if I am caught, neither the money that I have taken will be taken away from me, nor will I be punished very severely. It will take ages for courts to settle all these cases. That incentivizes me to uh, commit a fraud. So there are three things. One is the attitude, the second is the opportunity which is provided by poor internal controls, the third is the, uh, the incentive which is provided by the, uh, uh, the lack of uh, controls in the system. This is typically what is known as a fraud triangle. Then you have four, I mean like you know the, the good practices could be divided under four broad categories. One is the deterrent, then the, you first try to deter the fraud. You try to put the scare of God in the of, uh, potential fraudster saying that look, you know, you commit fraud, we'll catch you. We have systems, we have protected ourselves, so it's like, you know, a kind of a, a first line of defense where you say, look, you deter the fraud. Two, if I am not able to deter and somebody is still adventurous enough and uh, stupid enough to do it, then I have taken enough measures to prevent it. Then, even after taking preventive measures, somebody still may get through some loophole and then commit a fraud, then I should have sufficient detect mechanisms to catch him. Having caught him, I must have sufficient and strong investigative uh, uh, mechanism to bring him to justice. So you deter a fraud. If you can't, what is not able, been, been able to deter, you, next step you take is to prevent, and the third is you detect and then investigate. So your practices can be divided broadly under these four categories. And that is what has been done in this uh, compilation. So, but then these are all interlinked. Now, you know, you, you have a very good prevent mechanism, like suppose as, uh, or a detect mechanism, like say for instance, a CCTV surveillance, it's, a, it's a basically a detect mechanism, but then it also can prevent because, you know, somebody knows that, look, this place is under surveillance, so I better be careful. So it also acts as a prevent, also acts as a deterrent. Conversely, if, I, if somebody knows that this department or this organization where I'm working has very poor control, they don't do bank reconciliation regularly, nobody supervises, and everybody trusts me with uh, everything. So therefore what happens is then, then that kind of acts as a non-deterrence or a non-preventive. Like for instance, there is a famous case, in, I mean it happened in a very respectable, highly regarded public sector company like HAL in Bangalore where they entrusted the, all the RTGS payments to a person who was working with them as a casual worker. And this person gains the trust of the supervisor so much that you know, they trusted him with everything and then what he did was he took advantage of it and it started transferring money to some private accounts. So you have to have uh, basically these uh, measures which are in place. Then the other thing which, I mean, since the shortage of time, I will have to rush through this. Uh, we need a fraud control policy, which I find that it is absent in government. Most of the uh, uh, you know, countries abroad, you know, developed countries, they have a fraud control policy. Why is it important? What, is, what does a typical fraud control policy have? A fraud control policy would say, look, this is what we consider fraud, and we have zero tolerance to fraud, and then this is what we will do, and then you would have also people in charge for preventing, detecting fraud. So it is not something, you know, which you leave loosely and it happens and then you say, okay, now it has happened, let's, what do we do? You take proactive kind of a, a thing and then also you provide for a whistleblower uh, kind of a facility where people can report fraud and then you assure their confidentiality. So the policy would contain all these and then you would put it out as an organization. Then lastly, I think, you know, uh, one is that I would uh, emphasize on the anti-fraud culture. That is something which we need to establish in the organizations where we work. 
And what would that mean? Anti-fraud culture would mean that, look, you first, firstly, you, you would make it very clear that fraud is not tolerated. You kind of publicize it, saying that, look, uh, I mean, whether it is vendors, whether it is the employees, you tell them, look, fraud is not acceptable, we will deal with it. And uh, therefore, you know, you, you, you kind of uh, run the risk of being caught. Whereas on the, uh, what happens is that in, um, uh, as I think was mentioned uh, about uh, leaving the loophole in the law, in India what happens is that there are, there is instead of anti-fraud culture, there is a culture where, you know, fraud is facilitated. You know, like for instance, you know, you, I was doing several reviews, you know, in the course of my work as a consultant with uh, uh, this budget organization. There is a scheme in Karnataka, I'll stop with this, a Bhagilakshi scheme where, you know, money is invested in the name of a girl child when she is born. And then uh, at the age of 18, she gets uh, 1 lakh rupees, you know, that money is invested with the LIC. Now, that is uh, not a universal scheme. It is to be given to the uh, benefit is given to the below the poverty line. Uh, this is a big racket in India, this below the poverty line, because this is something which has not been defined very correctly, nor is it uh, surveyed correctly. So suddenly the government decides as a populist measure saying that, look, you know, we don't need a BPL card. All you do is go to Taisildar and get an income certificate. Now that leaves the door open for so much of uh, fraud because there are a lot of people who are not otherwise qualified just enroll themselves into the scheme because you have facilitated it. You have knowingly facilitated something uh, that, you know, would be taken advantage of. So. Sorry, given the shortage of time, I had to rush through because I need to give my panelists time. Uh, what I would say is that uh, as organizations, whether it is the bank or whether it is the government department or whether it is the corporate, you need to recognize fraud as a clear and present danger, that it is going to happen, then you need to have a policy, you need to have uh, mechanisms, you need to have practices which will deter, prevent, detect fraud. And there are... Uh, these are something which it should be possible for most of the organization to do it. Not leave it informally, not leave it uh, to chance, but recognize it and then act upon it. So with this I will stop and then I would request, uh, I think our panelists can go from this end. Mr. Dr. Mr. Salim Ali can, Dr. Salim Ali can come next. Thank you very much. <laughs>